Greetings, everyone. Today, I would like to bring a topic to you of great concern to me, and that is to emphasize the value of mechanical methods of compression in the surgical patient. Recently, these have come under uh, uh, sort of scrutiny because of the cost of them, and also some negative reports indicating that adding mechanical compression to anticoagulants does not enhance their value. At the same time, we have an explosion of a number of new and different devices for delivering mechanical compression. And so today I would like to re-emphasize the value of these methods in the surgical patient. We know that fatal pulmonary emboli are the number one preventable cause of death in hospitalized and surgical patients. Now there's a lot of complications you can't prevent after surgery, but this is one that you can prevent, these fatalities. And that's where the administration of, of a, a appropriate anticoagulation for the period of time that the uh, patient is at risk. And in order to further evaluate these patients and what is really critical, particularly in view of um, applying the mechanical prophylaxis to those patients that most need it. We need to score individual patients. And this has to be done regardless because their patients have different levels of risk. And we use the Caprini score because it's the most thorough history and physical that's been tested worldwide in over 5 million patients in more than 210 studies to date. And we know as the number of risk factors goes up, the incidence of venous thromboembolism goes up. We also know that risk factors have a different propensity to be associated with the thrombosis. Uh, bed rest, hormone replacement are at low, have a low chance of producing a venous thrombosis, whereas pancreatic cancer or also a cancer of the uh, esophagus have a higher chance of uh, causing a fatal uh, event. So that the synergistic effect of these factors together produces a number, a score, and that score is associated with the incidence of clinically relevant thrombosis. So here we see the results in general surgery. And as the incidence of, of, of the, as the score number goes up, the incidence of thrombosis goes up. And here we see the results in various populations, head and neck surgery, it's very low risk until you get to nine. Uh, plastic surgery, the same thing until you get over eight and, and so forth. So there are different set points in different populations but they, do, they are able to grade people according to their level of risk. And then you can tailor their prophylaxis to their level of risk. Now it's very difficult to collect all of the, these data. So we've employed a secret weapon and what is that? And that is involving patients in their own healthcare. Patients love to get involved in their healthcare. And, and thanks to a number of brilliant people from around the world, uh, you can see all nationalities, a, a, a bunch of different languages, Patient-friendly forms have been developed. They've been validated, comparing them to physician-completed forms. And the results are very, very good. Here, for example, is uh, the form. And there's two very special things about this risk assessment. And the number one is to track obstetrical-related complications. For women of childbearing age who develop these complications, such as stillborn infants, unplanned abortions, placental insufficiency and growth retardation associated with toxemia of pregnancy. Now these events may occur during a, a woman's childbearing years, but they could be the, the, the clue to an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome that carries through the, their life. And this syndrome is a very powerful predictor of venous thrombosis. And in some cases, if a person has this antibody, that may be the difference between developing a serious venous thromboembolism or not, after an operative procedure. Remember, even after a small operative procedure. Now, the other thing that's really key about this risk assessment is tracking family history of thrombosis. This is a very powerful risk factor of throm for thrombosis and the approved um, um, guidelines and risk scores for medical patients do not include family history of thrombosis. And it's only the British National Health S Survey uh, form that does include family history thrombosis. And by the way, this risk assessment tool from the United Kingdom 
when used over a two year period in the general population has reduced the incidence of deaths. So very, very important risk factor. Now one has to be very careful. A surgical procedure considered to be minor from the surgical standpoint may be very major from the thrombosis standpoint. So let's take a look back in history. We know that Professor Virchow, a famous pathologist in 1856, came up with the three factors he thought, uh, he knew and proved were associated with venous thromboembolism. Venous stasis, sludging of the blood, vessel wall injury, cracks in the wall of the veins, and hypercoagulability, increased coagulation of the blood. Well, when a patient gets an anesthetic, either a general anesthetic, where they have to give a muscle relaxant to relax all the muscles to intubate the patient, or a regional anesthetic, where they paralyze the patient's lower extremities, this can result in duplicating Virchow's triad. There is venous stasis due to calf muscle paralysis. As the muscles uh, relax, the veins dilate, the muscles tone keeps those veins at, at, a, at, a, at a good diameter. And you know, if you put your hand down uh, to your side and keep it there for any length of time, you'll really uh, develop some uh, big veins. Well, that goes on in the legs. And as that occurs and gets, those veins get bigger and bigger, the cracks can form in the walls. I'll show you that in a minute. At the same time, blood is pumping into the legs so that the volume in that leg is increasing and the flow out of the leg is not. So that creates a very, very stagnant situation like a stagnant pond. In addition to that, the, as the veins get bigger and, and, and uh, uh, they crack, we have uh, the ability of the blood to contact foreign surfaces, which can trigger coagulation. But also a major factor is those muscles aren't dead. They're still producing metabolites and waste products and those waste products are sitting in this sort of witch's brew and they're not getting flushed out of the leg like they should. And that also contributes to the hypercoagulability of the patient. And the patient may already have an increased level of hypercoagulability because of the reason they're having the operation for infection or trauma or cancer, uh, things like that. Now, this is a million power micrograph that I have uh, obtained uh, courtesy of a famous and brilliant vascular surgeon, uh, Dr. Tony Camerata. And this is a, 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 an experiment in an animal where venous dilatation has occurred. And you can see you're looking at a million power micrograph of the lining of the blood vessel. And look at the cracks, how it's split open. And uh, as a result of that splitting open, the, the, that results because the vein expands and the cracks form and then clots can form in there. Here we see clots forming in those cracks. Now, in addition to that, when the blood flow gets, uh, slows down, as you can see, darkens, the white cells turn into adhesion molecules. And these adhesion molecules slow down and they actually land on the surface of the endothelium. And then once that happens, a reaction occurs where they, they extrude their granules and this is an inflammatory reaction. And this inflammatory reaction then uh, damages the wall of the capillary. Other white cells come along and, and turn into adhesion molecules. And here we see an actual experiment in the experimental model. And if you look carefully, you can see one of these adhesion molecules molecules is getting ready to penetrate the wall of the capillary. Once this happens, the capillary is useless for the exchange of oxygen and nutrients. And that further contributes to this so-called witch's brew and chance for a blood clot. In addition to that, if the patient's leg happens to be straightened, then the blood flow behind the knee can be shut down. And here we see an experiment. We're looking at a knee uh, with the vein uh, in blue and the artery in red, and the, the leg is slightly bent. As the leg is straightened, in some cases, the gastric nemus vein, a gastric nemus muscle will compress the popliteal vein. It's a so-called popliteal entrapment syndrome. And that will force the blood to go around uh, the, this area and go to the surface veins, which again, slows the flow out of the leg and is a risk factor for thrombosis. So remember that minor operations may be major from the thrombosis standpoint. Those procedures requiring 45 minutes of general or regional anesthesia or more 
are considered major from the thrombosis standpoint. It may be a minor operation, but if it takes two and a half hours to, to repair a knee cartilage or repair ligaments, then that's a major procedure from the thrombosis standpoint. Remember, a pillow under the knees helps avoid the popliteal entrapment syndrome. So you have to remember that the total risk, VTE risk for a patient consists not only of the type of surgical procedure, but also the baggage that the patient brings to the operating room. Now, is there anything we can do about slowing down this witch's brew uh, that occurs during surgery with venous stasis, venous dilatation, hypercoagulability, and so forth? Actually, there is. The use of mechanical compression in the very high-risk patient is a must to protect this patient from suffering a serious or fatal a thromboembolic event. And therefore, the use of these devices during surgical procedures is mandatory. Now here I'd like to show you the single largest study using the Caprini score uh, so far, and this is 2,795,000 patients. It comes from our colleagues in Vietnam who've done a very careful job uh, looking at this over a two year period. And you can see as the, as the risk score goes up, the incidence of thrombosis goes up. And then we, we move from Vietnam to Russia, another beautiful uh, study done by another brilliant young man, uh, 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 Cyril Lobostov uh, from uh, Moscow. And what he showed is in a series of high risk patients, if they had a score of five to eight, their risk, only one patient had a scan detected DVT. Whereas if the score was 12 or above, uh, then 65% of them had a scan detected VTE. And then he went on further, and this is really important information, and you all need to go and look at the original publication. These investigators observed that within a, pay, a score of nine or more, the frequency of VTE was as high as 11%. And in those with a score of 11, the incidence of symptomatic patients in these very high-risk patients from Moscow was 59% despite the uh, uh, combination of external compression stockings. Now they graduated compression stockings and uh, low molecular weight heparin. So the authors postulated that the extremely high risk group uh, required some improvement. So we're gonna jack up the anticoagulation dose and increase the bleeding? No, they decided to combine pneumatic compression devices, mechanical compression with the low molecular weight heparin stocking combination. And what they found was uh, they had 407 patients uh, to, to be either in the anticoagulation group or the anticoagulation plus compression, pneumatic compression group. And all patients had blinded duplex scans preoperatively, 12 hours postoperatively, and every three to five days. Low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis was given for at least seven days or more in patients and IPC was used for 18 hours daily. The scheduled duplex ultrasound revealed uh, one clot in 240 patients that were in the combined group of mechanical compression plus low molecular weight heparin, whereas 34 breakthrough thrombosis occurred in the group with low molecular weight heparin alone. Five of the patients in that uh, alone group or control group uh, developed a pulmonary embolus and three died. No PE, including no deaths, were seen in the patients in the study group combining the mechanical methods with the anticoagulants. And there was no statistically significant difference in skin injury, incidence or, of PE-related mortality or postoperative mortality. So <clears throat> we find that very important information to use compression plus anticoagulation in the very high risk patient. Now, we come to a, a, a trial that has appeared uh, in, in, a, in one of the most respected journals in the world, the New England Journal, and it was a study involving 20 different countries. It was a, 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 a great uh, uh, example of people from around the world getting together. And what they did was they took a look at high-risk surgical patients and, and patients, a lot of the patients were medical in intensive care, they were seriously ill, but there were 16,000 patients uh, screened and they only selected 2,000 patients. 
But nevertheless, what did, what did they show? They showed among critically ill patients who were receiving pharmacologic prophylaxis, adjunctive intermittent pneumatic compression did not result in a significantly lower incidence of proximal lower limb deep vein thrombosis than using thromboprophylaxis alone. So as soon as this study hit the news, everybody came out and said, using all these mechanical methods, they're expensive. The New England Journal has just demonstrated studies done from around the world that proves that these do not really, aren't that really helpful. So hospitals began, began discontinuing these. And now I would say, wait a minute, let's look at the rest of the story. Go back and look at the data that came out of Moscow. See, these patients in this study here from the New England weren't risk assessed. So you had all the apples in the same barrel. So in there were a number of lower risk patients and then a few very high risk patients. Whereas the Moscow study showed that only in the very high risk patients, that's where the greatest value of this occurred. And then that's also forgetting all of the changes that occurred during surgery. Those weren't addressed by that study in the New England Journal. So we have to remember that the witch's brew, remember the witch's brew, a Virchow's triad, sort of on steroids in a patient with an operative procedure is, a, is something that requires the use of a mechanical method to mitigate those changes throughout the, throughout the course of the operation. I would also like to you to take a look at this study that we wrote regarding our discussion, regarding the interpretation of this sort of famous PREVENT trial. And we concluded that the authors have tried to uh, solve the uncertainty brought by the PREVENT trial, that was us, we we're the authors, by critically reviewing the results provided by the investigators. Most likely the delayed application of IPC in a predominantly medical cohort of patients admitted to ICU does explain the lack of, eff of effectiveness without ignoring the fact that IPC use was also allowed in the control group the use of a variety of IPC devices of variable clinical efficacy also may have reduced the true effect size of IPC. So the, the, the viewer needs to go back and look at those two studies and look at the positive and negatives in each study and, and make up your own mind. But remember, that doesn't address the witch's brew. Don't forget about the witch's brew. So in summary, what I would like to leave you with is a saying that came from my famous friend and who was an academic dentist, who is an academic dentist in Maine, when listening to the risk assessment. And he said, Joe, it's very simple. You would never want to kill a friend, of course, but you would never treat a stranger. So by performing a thorough history and physical in someone you just meet, they become more like a friend than a stranger. And of course, now they're your friends, you'd never hurt them. And of course, you would never treat a stranger. This is particularly important in the era of COVID-19. Now, in conclusion, I would have advocate performing risk assessment to identify the very high risk patients. Use mechanical compression to limit breakthrough thrombosis in those very high risk patients, in addition to low molecular weight heparin. They could be medical or surgical. And remember that the thrombosis potential associated with the surgical procedures is very, very significant. And the longer the procedure, the more profound these effects are. And you have to understand the importance of using mechanical methods during these operative procedures to mitigate and limit the effects of the so-called witch's brew or Virchow's triad on steroids. Mechanical prophylaxis is also the key for uh, patients with serious bleeding risks. So remember, these very important features, including uh, my admonition about friends and uh, and uh, uh, strangers. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and please visit my uh, social media sites, especially my YouTube channel, Venus Resource Center. And I'd be very appreciative if you subscribe. We try to provide good content for you every single week. Thank you very much. And I hope you all stay safe and have a great day. <music>